I speak to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. How was this week for you? Do you feel like you're barely functioning? Are you livid? Are you angry? Are you numb? Do you feel like you've been holding your breath for days, for weeks, for months, years? I have felt utterly breathless. Breathless when I held my daughter Tuesday a little too tight as she tried to wiggle out of my arms. Breathless when I, held, or I drove by Holden Elementary School in my neighborhood Wednesday morning as parents were letting go of their children's hands to enter into the building. Breathless when I heard our choristers on Wednesday night sing a stunning version of As I Went Down to the River to Pray, arranged by Stephen, as they opened our choral even song of prayer that night. And breathless, in thinking back to the first active shooter drill I ever participated in, fall 1999, my sophomore year of high school, and over 20 years later, I overheard a child say, I'm glad we practiced this at school. So when it happens, we will be ready. That's not something I expect to hear at church. More so when I'm working in the army, maybe. But not at church. Last week when I was working with my physical therapist, she looked at me and said, I don't worry about your strength or your form. I worry about your breath. You hold your breath. And when you are not breathing, your body, your muscles cannot do what they're supposed to do. That's your problem. You need to breathe. People of God, I cannot imagine that I am the only one who is breathless. I know I'm not the only one whose body has felt like it cannot do what it's supposed to do, whose muscles are tightened, and whose brain is a little too foggy because of the lack of oxygen. So we're going to breathe. Please. We're going to let that air come into our bodies. And you're going to hold it for four seconds and then let it go. Do a huge one like you just had a burrito. Fill that belly. I know the singers know. Fill that belly. We need to breathe. We can't do anything if we're not breathing. And for me, prayer is like a deep breath. We need to pray and we need to breathe. Prayer is the space where we can bring all of our emotions. We can bring our grief our pain, our anger, our lack of feeling, our numbness, our confusion, our fear. Because God has the capacity to hold all of these things if we're willing to pray. We're not built to carry all of this. Our hearts were not built for this. But God can. You know, I struggle during these times of tragedy when it seems like society starts to knock prayer a little bit. And honestly, without prayer, I don't know where to start. 
Without prayer, I can't act in any meaningful way. Without breath, I cannot move, I cannot run. Prayer is how we connect to God. It is how we connect to love. It's how we determine what is right and what is wrong, what is just or unjust. And it is actually what helps us as Christians recognize that we do need to act, that we do, in fact, need to do something. Where I do agree with the thoughts and prayers critique is that often it does stop at prayer if there was prayer at all. Stopping short at prayer is like this worship service without a proper dismissal to go in peace and love, serve the Lord, alleluia, alleluia. It's like partaking at this feast and staying right here in this building. Everything we do here orients us to the way that we're supposed to live out there. We are part of a story that does save lives, and we must share it. We must live it. There are so many stories of death circulating, and we have a story of life, of hope. In today's story of the Acts of the Apostles, we see these two competing stories, very distinct we see a story that almost led to death. And we see a story of life and hope. There's such a difference in how Paul and Silas responded to adversity and challenge and how the jailer did. Paul and Silas are imprisoned for placing a higher value on human life than money. Pretty simple. People should matter more than money. After healing the woman with the spirit of divination, her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone. They brought Paul and Silas before the authorities. They were stripped, beaten, and thrown into jail. And their response to this horror and trauma was to pray and to sing hymns to God while in pain, while in suffering, while fearful of what was to come, they still had hope. They were still alive. Now the jailer's story is quite different. When that earthquake occurred and he assumed that all the prisoners escaped, he was immediately stunned by fear And the only thing he could think of was death. It appeared to be the only option for him. He was completely and utterly hopeless. If it weren't for Paul, his voice crying out in the darkness, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. Death, by his own hand, would have been his legacy. It seems like most of our country feels like the jailer, overwhelmed, scared, hopeless, resigned to the story of death. Now, I don't believe that the jailer wanted death. I just think he couldn't see another option. I don't care who you are, no one wants to see gun violence as the leading cause of death for children in the United States of America. Nobody wants to be reading the prayers of our people each week and reading off the name of 10, 20 people, fellow Chicagoans who died by gun violence each week. Nobody wants this, and yet it is the prominent story of America, death. 
Just like the slave woman that Paul and Silas healed, the lives of our children, the lives of our neighbors, the lives of this nation or any other nation are not political currency. We must demand a story that is more than death. We must demand life. Now we can learn a lot from Paul and Silas. We must start in prayer. And I do not mean some BS on Twitter. I mean gather together and pray. Lament, scream, sing, walk, cry, breathe. Breathe, breathe. And then when we've caught our breath, we go. We go and we share a story of hope and life in a world that desperately needs it. Like Paul and Silas, we must advocate for human life over money, human life over power, human life over status, human life over votes. We demand life with our voices, with showing up, yes, with our votes, and yes, with our money. Some claim this nation to be great, but it seems to me that we're struggling to simply be good. Now this might sound crazy from somebody who serves in the United States Army, But the reason that I am proud to serve is because the army is made up of beloved children of God. And all of us who call this nation home are beloved. Every child, every person. It seems to me that our pursuit of becoming the greatest nation on earth only perpetuates the story of death. Instead, let us focus on developing that beloved community, a community of hope, a community of life, a community focused on how Jesus taught us to live and to love. Let us remember the baptismal covenants that we share, that we celebrated just two hours ago in this space when we welcomed a new child of God. That is where we find true freedom. So my friends, while we are here, take a deep breath. And remember, you can always come back here when you need to catch your breath. But we have to go. We have a story to tell. We have a story to continue living. Amen.